Amen. Brothers and sisters, it's good to be together this morning. Thank you very much for coming out in the slightly rainy weather to enjoy the Lord with us together this morning. As we begin our worship, we're going to give you some updates and a few uh, details of announcements about a few things that are happening amongst our church family. Really glad to see Diane here. Welcome. Good to see you this morning. We have a number of folks who are slowly coming for the first time or so. And so again, I need to make a few of these announcements that for some of you are really repetitive, but we need folks to be sure that they catch on. It's just such a joy for as a pastor and as our fellow leaders at the church to be able to report our continuing income of revenue and givings here at the church. I want to thank you so much again for the way you are continuing to understand that the legitimate finances of our church are an ongoing thing and you continue to provide. You can drop your uh, offering just in the little plate on the back on the way in or you can mail it in if you like or as Emmy says that new uh, Interact uh, e-transfer has just been a wonderful way for folks to continue to give so thanks for doing that. We are taking this time very seriously as best as we understand by the medical professionals that's not who we are. We take the advice of others to keep you as safe as under God we know how to be able to do. And so to that end, we have, as you know, upgraded the air filtration in this room. That's a, a really key way to keep a space safe. And so every 15 minutes, this room is recycled. We do really have a ministry of cleaning. Iris cleans diligently on Saturday and you're sitting in a very clean room. And then in between our services, she cleans as well, and so we're grateful for that. We do wear our masks, and we wear them the entire time we're here. It's a little bit of a pain, but there's no question we need to do that. We have enough hand sanitizer here to sink a ship, it feels like, and we want to encourage you to use that as well as think about that physical distancing. It really is two paces that you should be between a person who's not in your household when you're speaking to them. And that's difficult when you've got your mask on. And so we have to reject, but just please, uh, please do keep that in mind. We're grateful for the technology that the Lord has given us, the internet uh, upgrades we've done here to live stream our second service each Sunday morning. And so this service we record on a video to put on our regular YouTube channel. But during our second service, if you're not able to be here, or if you know of folks who aren't able to be here, just let them know if you would, that they can tune in just go to my personal Facebook page, that seemed to be the easiest spot, and we'll live stream the, the second service. So to that end, we continue to have both of these services at 9.30 and at 11 o'clock, and we're doing that for one hour. Now we may reassess this in the coming weeks, uh, in the coming months, to see how our numbers are, but we like to have a fewer number of people in each service, and we like to have a shorter amount of time together. And that's part of the reason we say to folks, we're glad you're here, and when the service is over, we're glad you've been here, but please leave immediately. <laughs> and part of that is so that we can clean in between, and we don't have too much uh, meeting of people from the second service coming in and the first service leaving, because we only have a half an hour in between both of those. We do ask you to reserve your seats, and folks have been very kind to do that, as well as if you are regularly or... Um, consistently registered for your spot. If you're not going to be there, call Catherine or uh, email in to let them know that you're not going to be there as well. You can do that by the email address, you can do that on our church website, or you can most simply call the church and leave a message on the voicemail. I was really happy the last couple of weeks because we have had the highest attendance of people coming back the last two Sundays. And so we had a number of folks out in our wonderful outdoor service and we had the highest attendance last week between both services. And so praise God, folks are coming back and understanding that there's opportunities to do that. And so I wanna encourage you to encourage the folks that are not here to consider coming here. Again, we're doing the best we know how to keep this place safe. There is a spiritual consequence of not joining with God's people. And God knows that. And God in his kindness can provide for us. But when we can meet, we should meet. That's sort of the phrase that we've been using and want to encourage folks who haven't come, folks who are watching this video perhaps later word, come, give it a try, realize it really is a safe environment. This 
coming Wednesday night, when we normally have our Facebook Live at 7 o'clock, we've been going through a little series on discipleship for the next generation. Every Wednesday evening, you can tune in the same spot, my personal Facebook page at 7 o'clock, but not this week. I will be away this week for a couple of extra days celebrating the marriage of my son Caleb and his wife, Micah. This is their little puppy, Oakley. Uh, he's not nearly that little now, or she isn't nearly that little. This was in the summertime. Some of you know that our family was, uh, had bear the consequence of COVID like so many did. They were to be married in July. Instead, Pam and I went zipping up in the dead of night, as it were, on Good Friday, out at a cottage in the middle of nowhere, where Micah's parents have a cottage, and it was just the two of them, the Pam and I, and Caleb and Micah, and we did their wedding. And so they were married then. We celebrated in July. That's the picture here. And we're going to be celebrating next weekend with what has become a vow renewal ceremony, and then the reception that we're able to have. And of course, it's Thanksgiving. And so there's a lot to be grateful for. And I'm personally grateful for my brother in the Lord, David Hallett, as he will yet again come to our pulpit and bring the word of God next Sunday while Pam and I are away celebrating with the family. So think of that next Sunday to come with a thankful heart in the midst of the restrictions and the challenges we have. Ask God to give you eyes to see the evidence of his grace that we'd be able to join together with great joy and thanksgiving. This morning, we're about to enter into a service that includes communion. I hope all of you have got one of your little communion cups there. If not, there's some on the back table there, of course. They have only been touched with tongs, and they are separated on those trays so that no one else has touched it, so they are as sanitary as we know how. Remember, these little cups, we want to maintain a sense of solemnity and reverence without these things being annoyances. So remember, you can take both of them off, or you can just simply pull, peel the top part back. You've got the bread on top and the wine or the drink on the bottom. And keep that in mind that when we come to that point in the service, that God would help us to focus on Christ and his great sacrifice on behalf of sinners like us. Would you stand together with me? And let's open our service with the word of prayer then, please. Heavenly Father, honor your Son that we might be encouraged in the knowledge that your son has preeminence in our lives, in our church, in this city and province and country and world. We ask Heavenly Father that in the midst of some trying times, some times that are often full of anxiety, times that are fraught with frustration, Dear God, we ask that you would cause us to see that this morning, your mercies are brand new. What we need to honor you this day, you have promised to give. And so we cry out that you would give what we need to honor you, we pray. Thank you for those who are here. Thank you for those who are watching on video later. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the care that you've shown us. And we pray that as we worship you, we will do so in spirit and in truth to the end that Christ would be enjoyed in our midst and therefore he would be glorified in our midst. We humbly ask that you would hear the prayers of our hearts this day. We offer it in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated, friends.
Is that not our hope on a morning like this? That God would be pleased to draw us all the more closer to him to the end that again his name would be made much of. I'm going to ask Cindy to come and to read our call to worship this morning as by the word of God we draw closer to the person of God. Please join with me in, in reading God's holy, precious word from the book of 7 Corinthians chapter 4 verses 3 through 6. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank God for his word. Amen. Friends, I'm going to ask you as we move into this time that we celebrate and remember the kindness of our Lord in the communion table, that you let this next song pour over you, waft over you, if you will, that indeed it is in the face of Christ that we see God most clearly. And he has called us to remember what he has done, what that person and work of Christ has done, and what it means to us as his people. Listen together, if you would, please. Though the word of God is trampled on by fools. 
Why is it that by God's grace, how is it that by God's grace that we will know with assurance that we will see his face one day? Let one of our fellow preachers, D.A. Carson, tell us precisely why we will see his face. Picture two Jews by the name of Smith and Brown, remarkably Jewish names. The day before the first Passover, having a little discussion in the land of Goshen. And Smith says to Brown, Boy, are you a little nervous about what's going to happen tonight? Brown says, Well, God told us what to do through a servant of Moses. You don't have to be nervous. Haven't you slaughtered the, the lamb? Daubed the two doorposts with blood? Put blood on the lintel? <laughs> 
Haven't you you've done that? You're all ready? You're back to go? You're going to eat the, the whole Passover meal with your family? Well, of course I've done that. I'm not stupid. But it's still pretty scary. When you think of all the things that have happened around here recently, you know, flies and river turning to blood. And pretty awful. And, and, and now there's a threat of the firstborn being killed? You know? It's all right for you. You've got three sons. I've only got one. I love my Charlie, and, 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 and the angel of death is passing through tonight. You, you, you know, I, I know what God says. I put the blood there, but, but it's pretty scary. I'll be glad when this night is over. And the other one responds, bring it on. I trust the promises of God. That night, the angel of death swept through the land. Which one lost his son? And the answer, of course, is neither. Because death doesn't pass over them on the ground of the intensity or the clarity of the faith exercised. But on the ground of the blood of the Lamb. That's what silences the accuser. The blood silences the accuser of the brothers as he accuses us before God. He silences our consciences when he accuses us directly. How many times do we ride in agony asking if God can ever love us enough, if God can ever care for us enough after we've done such stupid, sinful, rebellious things, after being Christians for 40 years? What are you going to say? Well, you know, God, I tried hard, you know? I did, I did my best. I said it was a bad moment. No, no, no. I have no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died, and he died for me. We overcome him by the blood of the Lamb. There is the ground of all human assurance before God. There is the ground of our faith. Not guaranteeing intensity of faith, so fickle are we. It's not the intensity of our faith, but the object of our faith that saves. They overcome him on the ground of the blood of the Lamb. Sometimes you just let someone else say it, because I just couldn't say it any better than that. You and I know that one day we will see God in the face of Christ on the grounds of the shed blood of Christ. That's it. Not the intensity of my faith or the clarity of my faith, but the genuineness of the faith because of the finished and completed work of our King. Hallelujah. So I'm going to ask you to please take your communion cups. And Errol, if you would come at this time, please. And peel off the top part so that you can have the bread ready to go. And Errol is going to come, and as I read the scripture, he is going to pray both for the bread, and then we'll eat, and then the cup, and then we'll eat. So let me read the scripture this time from 1 Corinthians and the 11th chapter, where the Apostle Paul has received what he is going to be giving to us. He said, for I received from the Lord... What I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. So do this in remembrance of me. Brother Errol, please give thanks for this bread. Father, we are here to be this remember that you died for our sins. Because of your death, we have life and we have it more abundantly. Mm. For he left an example for us that we should take and eat. He said, Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, I just ask you the blessing on this bread we are about to partake. In your name, I ask it. Amen. Amen. Let's eat with thanksgiving, friends. In the same way, 
also. He took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Friends, if you would remove the top of your juice, and Errol will offer a prayer and thanksgiving for the cup as we drink it in a moment together. Please, brother. Lord, once again, we thank you for shedding your blood for us. The big sacrifice you made for us, Lord, and we today will have life. Father, we don't know how to give you thanks. Hmm. Words cannot express what you have done for us. So Father, we just ask you to bless this cup as we partake. Not an example you left for us to do. So Lord, we ask you just to be in charge now and to search our heart as we partake of this cup in honor of you. In the name of Jesus, Amen. Amen. Let's drink together, friends. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you, we, proclaim the Lord's death until he comes, until we see him face to face. Amen. Thank you, brother. Let's continue in a few moments of meditation over the word that flows from this great sacrifice that we have remembered this morning. And you may remember last week, friends, that we ended last Sunday with the great triumphal confession of God's servant Job in the 42nd chapter, the last chapter of that momentous book. He lifted his eyes to heaven, as it were, in his fruit of his repentant state and said, Lord, I know you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Amen. He said, I know that all things are by your doing. Therefore, you can do all things. I know that you have a purpose in everything you do and none of your purpose may be thwarted. We found ourselves learning from Job, didn't we, in the midst of challenges and yet to be complete triumphs, triumphants or triumphs in our lives, as it were. Job taught us things like, God is not against you. God is not against you even when life is hard. He reminded us that God is not harming you even when life hurts. He taught us that God has a reason for everything he's doing, even when what he's doing doesn't seem to us to be reasonable. We learned that God has a purpose, even when God seems to be arbitrary. That God is in charge, even when he feels absent. And therefore, he is caring for you even if it feels like God is unconcerned for you. And yet I know, brothers and sisters, that we all wrestle with feelings that don't seem to match up to our theological certainties. And we don't know what to do with that, do we? I know God's a certain kind of God. Well, then why would I feel this way? I know those are the promises of God. Why would I doubt I know like Smith and Brown, these two people that Dr. Carson mentioned, that the fact of what God is going to do does not change based on our feelings, but we are affected by the change in our feelings, aren't we? And sometimes we're not sure what to do about it. I'm wanting, dear friends, this morning for us to understand that the Lord Jesus Christ himself knew precisely your experience and mine. As he would look to heaven from that cross and ask his heavenly father, why would you turn your back on me? Now, God had not turned his back on him, not absolutely and not ultimately. And yet Christ himself, the sinless lamb of God, could feel so strongly 
That real separation, not absolute separation, but that real separation between him and his father because of our sin, that he could cry out with something that almost seems blasphemous to think that his father could ever ultimately and finally and completely and for good forsake him. And brothers and sisters, as we are struggling through this stage, this new stage, isn't it? This is a new stage of this corona. The children were not in school for very long last March, and now they've gone back. And as we said, of course, the numbers have gone up. And as the numbers have gone up, people's anxieties have gone up. And anxieties have gone up. People's opinions about the problem are awash, aren't they? The news loves it. The gossip columnists love it. And before you know it, you and I get caught in being so sure that anything that's being done wrong must have been because of either incompetence or foolishness or hatred towards other people. And you can feel things even about God that on one hand you know are not true, but you feel them just the same. Three weeks ago, I attended a brief pastor's um, retreat up at Muskoka Bible Camp. And I mentioned to some of you that I received as a gift there from John Friesen, the director, this book by Mark Vrokop. Mark Vrokop is a pastor of College Park Church in Indianapolis. And I don't usually dive into new books, but for whatever reason, God gripped my heart with this book that's called Dark Clouds, Deep Mercy, understanding or reclaiming the concept or the discipline of biblical lament. This is very new for me. And, and I said to the guys, I said, you know, if I'm learning something like this, is it right for me to share it with the congregation? And of course, my wife said, well, isn't that why you go away on these retreats? Isn't that why the church sends you so that you can take it in and feed the congregation what God is feeding you? And yet I'm saying to you, brothers and sisters, this is very fresh for me still. Part of the reason I find myself so emotional again this morning, it's very fresh for me, but very solidly biblical, I believe. And I'm wanting to encourage you this morning in this concept of godly complaint. That's how Mark Vrokop puts it. The idea of not man or human complaining and whining and on and on with my grumbling and moaning. No, no. Godly complaint. That, that, that is very similar to this concept or just another synonym for biblical lament. You know that term lamenting? Crying out? Full of sorrow? But to, to articulate that to our God. Pastor Vrokop says that lament is a prayer in pain that leads to trust. It's a transparent honesty before God that is a pathway to praise even when life is hard. Now God's servant Job certainly knew something about lament and he didn't do it perfectly. Who does? But coming through his repentance even his discipline from the Lord. God's servant Job knew what it was to move from pain to praise. And my hope is for a few minutes this morning, we might equip to be, to be able to do that ourselves, to move from pain to hope through honest, legitimate lament and godly complaint to the Lord. And, and friends, I just want you to understand that this experience is all of ours to some degree, isn't it? I know what God is like, but there's times it just doesn't feel like that. You, you, you can't reason, you can't just turn your heart on and off. And brothers and sisters, I'm suggesting this morning that you may have more liberty than you realize. Certainly more than I realized a couple of weeks ago to articulate feelings that may very well be wrong or inaccurate, but feelings that are real to you and I and articulate them to God with the liberty that perhaps you didn't realize you have. I want you to know this morning in terms of application 
that with all you're dealing with these days, it's okay for it to hurt. It really is okay for this to be painful. It's okay for you to feel frustration. It is okay for you to cry out to God in the midst of your frustration, in the midst of the fact that it hurts, to cry out to God for answers to what in the world is going on. You are free and it's okay to recognize, it's even okay to articulate your pain to the Lord. It's okay, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge that you feel like God is against you. I've worded these very carefully. Read them very carefully, please. It's okay to feel, to acknowledge that you feel like God is against you. It's not slander to tell God how you're feeling in the midst of your difficulty. It's not slander to complain to God. I did not say to complain about God, but to God. It is not only good, there is biblical warrant for exactly doing that. It is okay for you to grieve your losses after eight months of a world that has been turned on its head in a way it just simply never has before. And so these next couple of minutes, I want to encourage you to see in the one spot or one of the spots that these truths are grounded, not in a book or an opinion by Pastor Vrokop, as much as I'm grateful for him. We want to see these things grounded in the scriptures. If you have your Bibles, turn to Psalm number 13. Psalm 13, the Psalms are almost in the middle of your Bible. And if you go to the chapter 13, the large numbers are the chapter numbers there, and the smaller ones are the verses that we'll refer to. Psalm 13, written by David. Listen to the liberty with which David pours out his complaint, that he articulates his lament. And he, just like Job, is not rebuked for his feelings is not disciplined for his feelings, but ultimately must come, it must come back to not the fruit, which is feelings, but the root, which is heartfelt belief and commitment to the promises of God. But we've got to get there from the pain to the promise, from the difficulty to the hope, from struggling with assurance to the point of real rock solid trust through the pain to the peace. Look how David says it in Psalm 13. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long? Must I wrestle with my thoughts or take counsel in my soul? And day after day, there is sorrow in my heart. How long will my enemy triumph over me? He says, look on me, Lord, and answer, Lord, my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I've overcome him. And my foes will rejoice when I fall. Do you hear the honesty of King David there? Do you hear his heart-wrenching pain of feeling what Christ articulated? Why have you hid your face from me, forsaken me, removed yourself so far from me? How long is this going to last? Doesn't it sound like things you and I have said in the last few months? How long already? Isn't this enough? 
I can't take it anymore. I don't know what to do. I can't stand it. I'm not going to do it anymore. And we tear off our masks. We go back to large group gatherings. We do not take any safety protocols anymore because I've had enough. Well, we don't say that because we know that sounds selfish and silly. And so we move to what sounds like wisdom. Well, I don't think the mask works anyway. Well, I don't really think it's that big a deal. I, I'm not really sure it's not a hoax after all. Not many people are really dying. It's really not that bad. And we've moved from disgruntled, discouraged Christians to epidemiologists and disease experts. And it's all because we're not sure what to do to move from the pain to the peace of God that surpasses the understanding that I so wish that I could live on. Brothers and sisters, the, 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 the reality here is how do I overcome my articulation of wrong feelings? How do I get there? How do I articulate my wrong thinking? How do I get from wrong feelings that I'm articulating? How do I get to the point that it actually affects my thinking? Well, Mark suggests that lament is a pathway to praise when life gets hard. So, what do we do? Well, I found myself wrestling this week with, is it okay, is it permissible, is it right to feel wrong about God? Is it right, is it permissible to feel wrong about God? And that I, I couldn't come up, come up with a yes. And yet I know that David just articulated wrong feelings about God. I know that Job said all kinds of things. But when he felt things that were wrong, he was not rebuked for that. David was not disciplined for his wrong feelings. The heavens did not open up and say, What son of course forsaken you? As I wrestled with this, as I say, this is fresh for me. We're learning together. My brother, Pastor Josh Gorgi, who's a good buddy of mine, he pastors at Lakeside Church in Kenora, which is about as far west in Ontario as you can go. And Josh called me providentially, and he's very wise. And I asked him this question. I said, Josh, is it right to feel wrong things about God? And he said, maybe the category is different. It's not right or wrong, it's true or false. Is, it, is that a true thing that I just said about God, or is that a false thing? I, I, I might feel it, but is it true or is it false? And I thought, doesn't that just break through? Just break through the feelings of, okay, Yes, that's what I feel, but that's not who God really is. And I know that. Even though I'm feeling something different, it's truth that's going to help me break through. It's not okay to believe that God is against you. Do you know why it's not okay to believe that? Because it's not true. That's so helpful for me. Is it, is it, it's not okay because it's not right. Yeah, I know, but it's not right because it's not true. It's not how it is. It's not okay to believe, not feel now, to believe that God is harming you. It's not okay to believe God's harming you because that's not the truth of it. He's not harming you. It's not okay to only complain to God. It's okay to complain in a godly complaint, but it's not okay to only complain because that's not enough. That's not a sufficient response to the grace of God that we've just reckon, recommend, uh, recounted, excuse me, <laughs> recounted in the communion table. It's not enough to just complain to God. Because as you see the final verse of Psalm 13, look at the triumphant. 
Look at the triumphant word of one who has pressed through the pain and found their way to peace. But I trust in your unfailing love. Despite all these things I was feeling, David says, I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices, in fact, in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been or he has dealt bountifully with me. He has been so good to me. Do you see how this breaks through? How truth breaks through? God's unfailing love becomes his focus. God's salvation becomes his focus. God's goodness becomes his focus. And therefore he will sing the Lord's praises. Just a year ago, Facebook told me this morning <laughs> that this was the post that I had a year ago today. That tough times are to be embraced for the good they lead to rather than reproached for the pain they lead through. And I thought, how providential that the challenges that you and I have are articulated in a number of ways. But the psalmist in Psalm 119, verse 67, he says, before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now, now after I was afflicted, now I keep your word. He says in verse 71 of that same psalm, it is good or it was good for me that I was afflicted that I may learn your statutes. The pain, the frustration, the confusion, the heartache, the loss, the grief that you are free and encouraged in a godly complaint to cry out to God with it, presses us through that to recognize the promises of God. What we actually know to be true is where we can stand. And is that not what the fruit of the gospel is in the life of the people of God? Recognizing that we have ignored God. That we have said like a child, you're not the boss of me. No one is the boss of me. I will do what I want, the way I want, and when I want it. No one is to tell me. And we articulated our sin so clearly and displayed our independent sinfulness so clearly that God would be pleased to have to send his son into the world to deal with independent sinful hearts like mine. And that he would live in accordance with God's will. And that he would go to the cross paying the price for me not living according to God's will. The debt that I incurred, that I built up, he would pay by the shed blood of the Lamb. So that when I am given this gift of faith, when I surrender my life to him, when I bank on him for eternity, not in what I've done, despite what I've done, I will for all eternity say my heart rejoices in your salvation. Not my man-made salvation, in your salvation. And so he closes this beautiful psalm that I will sing to the Lord for he has been so good to me. When, brothers and sisters, will we sing that? When will it be no longer interrupted with my whining and moaning and grumbling and still being sanctified heart? When will it be that when I open my mouth, nothing but the praise of heaven will come out? It will be that day that we see his face. So let me encourage you to meditate one more time on the words of this glorious song that points us to the truth of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Though the wicked never stumble and
I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Hallelujah. Would you stand, friends? Let's close our prayer, our service of prayer. One day, dear God, one day all of this will be behind us. That's your promise. That's not our frustrated, angry, selfish opinion. No, that is your promise for your people. That one day all of the grief and the tears and the discouragement, all of the frustration and the loss, all of the consternation and confusion, all of the challenges that we bring and brought into this room today, one day you will wipe it all away. Until then, dear God, we pray that we would be found faithfully clinging to the truth of your promises, crying through our pain to you who is the author and finisher of our faith, the one who, by all, whose will by all things are done, whose purposes cannot be thwarted. I pray, Heavenly Father, that we will leave here assured of your kingly reign over this world, and that, Heavenly Father, we would continue to give ourselves in the service of others that they might come to know and worship our King and feel that steadfast hope that there is that is only found in the Lord Jesus. Hear our prayer, Heavenly Father. We humbly offer it now in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, friends. We're dismissed.